Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lazy Programmer Show. Now, I've been wanting to do a video on the topic of predicting stock prices for a pretty long time, but due to making actual courses, I haven't been able to find the opportunity. Recently though, I've been noticing a lot of new content coming out that is just so bad and so comical that truthfully, I can't believe it's real. One reason I've been procrastinating with these videos is because there are just so many mistakes to talk about. Now, I'm a little slow, so it took me a while to realize this, but I just realized that this would be way easier if I made one video devoted to just one of these mistakes. This way, I don't have to rush, and there will be more content for you guys in the future. Okay, so this video is devoted to one mistake I notice in nearly every script, which is min-max scaling. There are other mistakes as well, which I will not talk about in this video, but here's a brief outline for what you can look forward to. Number one, using prices as inputs. This will be related to the current lecture, but there are subtle differences to consider. Number two, using prices as targets. This may surprise you, but if you are doing so-called stock predictions, predicting actual prices is useless. Again, this is related to number one and somewhat related to the topic of this current video. Number three, incorrect train test splits. This will make your so-called stock price predictions look nearly perfect. And yet, if your stock price predictions are perfect, then why are you posting your code on GitHub and not running off with billions of dollars? So the real question is, why do these predictions that look perfect actually turn out to be completely useless? Number four, no baseline. If I had to guess, I would guess that most of these people who copy their code from other people have no clue what the word baseline even means. These people have no idea they are writing code that cannot beat the naive forecast, which is the optimal forecast under the random walk hypothesis, which states that stock movements are unpredictable. Number five. Now, this one is one of the most ridiculous mistakes I've seen in a while. So this mistake is that tons of people are building LSTMs, which are deep neural networks meant to predict sequences. And yet, all of these scripts are using a sequence length of one, which means they are not using sequences at all. Okay, so hopefully I'm making sense here. You have a bunch of people who have zero clue what they are doing using LSTMs, which are meant for sequences, and the data that they are passing in is not even a sequence. And remember, that's your whole premise. Your premise is that you think that past stock prices will help you predict future stock prices. You think that the LSTM will pick up some pattern in the sequence of historical data, and yet you are not even passing in that data. In other words, this is just a completely idiotic approach. Before we continue on with this lecture, we've got three very quick announcements. Announcement number one, you have two weeks left before the VIP coupon expires for my latest course, Financial Engineering and Artificial Intelligence in Python. Announcement number two, you also have two weeks left before the VIP coupon expires for my PyTorch course. Announcement number three, you now have the opportunity to vote for the topic of my next course. The survey is very short at just three multiple choice questions, plus an optional free form input, so it shouldn't take more than a few seconds. The link to the voting form can be found in the description below. Okay, so what's in my financial engineering course? Well, basically everything you would find in a typical financial engineering course, plus algorithmic trading, plus machine learning. Basically, it's financial engineering from a machine learning perspective. More importantly, I will expose many of the fake data scientists out there promising to teach you things like how to predict stock prices with LSTMs. Unless you want to look completely incompetent in your next job interview, do not trust what you learn from those courses. This comes with a personal offer from me, which is that if you request it, I will let you know whether or not you are taking a course from one of these fake data scientists and what mistakes to look for. Okay, so why should you learn PyTorch? Well, don't listen to me. Let everyone who does machine learning for a living speak for themselves. Most research papers are now implemented in PyTorch. Many companies like OpenAI, Apple, and more have switched to using PyTorch. In fact, Google it yourself and look at charts like these. It is undeniable that if you want to learn deep learning, you should learn PyTorch. 
This course contains everything from the basics like ANNs, CNNs, and RNNs, all the way up to transfer learning, recommender systems, GANs, NLP, facial recognition, and building a stock trading bot using deep Q learning. Remember that the VIP versions of both of these courses contain entire sections of material that will not be available in the non-VIP versions. Again, these coupons expire in two weeks, so get your copy today. And also, don't forget to vote on what you want to see in my next course. You can find a link to the survey in the description below. So what is the root problem of all this? The problem is, nobody ever writes their own code. All you have are people who copy their code from other people. The last point I raised, which was about accidentally using a sequence length of one, actually illustrates this quite well. You see, a few years ago, I never saw this mistake. Most of the crappy blogs and courses and GitHub accounts were all using the same code, which at least used a sequence as input. And recently, I suppose some beginner decided to make an LSTM with a sequence length of one. And so what happened? Well, all of these other beginners copied the first beginner, and now you have a ton of GitHub accounts and Udemy courses with this exact same mistake. So personally, I find this very interesting from the concept of virality. This is like a virus that spreads, just like any other viral video or news article on the internet. Except it's not viral in the sense that a lot of people are talking about it, nor is it funny or entertaining but it captures some part of the human imagination that causes it to spread like a meme. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. What's wrong with min-max scaling? Well, let's ask ourselves, what is the purpose of min-max scaling? The idea is your data has some minimum value and it has some maximum value. We know that standardizing our inputs before passing them into a machine learning model is generally a good idea. By this I mean subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. In fact, this is so useful that modern deep learning incorporates this concept with a technique called batch norm. This does a standardization not just at the input, but at every layer. So why do we do this? Well, generally speaking, we want our data to occupy a small range of values. For example, if you're looking at house price data, you don't want the number of bedrooms to range from 0 to 5 and the price to range from, say, 10,000 to 10 million. You want everything on the same scale, and you want everything to be small. One example of where min-max scaling is appropriate is when you're working with images. Why? Well, image pixel values have a fixed minimum and maximum. The min value is 0, and the max value is 255. As mentioned, we like neural networks to work within a small range of values, so we can use min-max scaling in this scenario to scale down the pixel values. Essentially, 0 goes to 0, 255 goes to 1, and anything less than 255 goes to a number between 0 and 1 proportionally. One alternative is to scale from minus 1 to plus 1, but that's not really relevant at this time. So why can't you do the same thing with stock prices? Well, we first have to ignore the fact that you shouldn't be working with prices in the first place. So let's not consider that right now. What is wrong with using min-max scaling on prices? Well, the problem is prices are always increasing. In other words, there is no maximum value. You might say, well, why can't we use the maximum value in the train set? Well, this is not the true maximum. Unlike images, the price has no upper bound. With images, you know your maximum is 255. With stock prices, there is no such idea. Now, let's say you fixed one of your mistakes, which is to use stock returns instead of stock prices. Stock returns look like this when you plot them like a time series. As you can see, there is no trend, and hence there is essentially less of a chance that they will increase without bound. So maybe you think, now is a good time to use min-max scaling. But in fact, this is still not correct. As you recall, there is an alternative option, which is called standardization. In fact, when we look at the distribution of stock returns, we can see that it looks like this. Now, one common misconception is that you can only use standardization if your data is normally distributed. However, that's not correct. In any case, this data does look at least reminiscent of a normal distribution, and thus it would seem that standardization is more appropriate. 
If you take my financial engineering course, you will learn that this distribution is much closer to a student T distribution or a Gaussian mixture. In either case, it should be clear that using standardization makes a lot more sense than min-max scaling, since as you can see, there essentially is no min and there is no max. Okay, so I want to conclude this video by saying that min-max scaling is not the kind of mistake that will break your results, unlike the others. The point of this video is to show you why it does not make sense. In fact, min-max scaling is not even necessarily wrong. However, it becomes more wrong when you don't use the right inputs like prices. And because everyone out there is just copying other people, none of these people are actually thinking, or they never learned about these concepts to begin with. This is truly a sad state of affairs, and it is just another reason why I always advocate learning how to code from scratch. Copying other people is a nearly useless activity, and as you can see, it's especially bad because it requires the other person you are copying from to be correct. When that's not the case, as it is here, everyone starts doing the incorrect thing, and it spreads. Now what happens? Well, a beginner might go searching for how to predict stock prices with LSTMs. As a concept, this is not an unreasonable idea. But then a beginner will see all this code, which is wrong, but because there's so much of it, they might assume it's correct. I suppose the bright side to this is that the threshold for competence is quite low. Hundreds of thousands of people are learning these ideas from instructors on Udemy and elsewhere. In other words, you don't have to try very hard if you want to outshine them in the industry. And if you're watching this video, then at least you know you're not one of them.